and washed and anointed himself and changed his clothes. And he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. He then went to his own house. And when he had asked, they set food before him and he ate. Then his servants said to him, What is this thing that you have done? You fasted and wept for the child while he was alive. But when the child died, you arose and ate food. He said, While the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, Who knows whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live. But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Then David comforted his wife Bathsheba and went in to her and lay with her. And she bore a son, and he called his name Solomon. And the Lord loved him and sent a message by Nathan the prophet. So he called his name Jedidiah because of the Lord. Dear Lord, we thank you for this time together and let us, again, not just be hearers, but doers as we uh, sit under your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Please be seated. First off, some of you may have come this morning expecting our pastor, Jerry. But we think it's important to occasionally, why should a pastor get a day off and have to leave town, right? Leave Morgantown. So occasionally, Pastor Jared takes a day and that he stays in town. I was looking, being the entomologist, I was looking for a giant wasp up there or something. I don't know. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. So, so anyways, so that is what is going on. Pastor Jared took a day off and he didn't have to leave town to do so. So we think that is important. So, as you remember, let's back up a little bit. In chapter 11, everybody was sending somebody somewhere. Messengers, send this message. Tell this person. Tell that person. David, Bathsheba, back and forth. All these messengers are running around, right? Everybody was sending messengers. But now it is Yahweh's turn to send the messenger. So, but, if this is your first time reading, or even every time we read this, we think, what is going on? All right. Should the heavy hand of God or punishment be coming down on David? We expect retribution, punishment. We expect judgment upon David. And there, that is, is here within the story, as you heard some of that this morning. But enter in the land of grace. God's something for nothing when we don't deserve anything. So let's, uh, let's talk about our first point this morning. We're going to be talking about the pursuit of grace. First and foremost, grace is going to be the common theme throughout this sermon or this lesson here this morning. And we see that Yahweh sent Nathan. Now a lot of times, you all have heard me up here many times, especially through 1 Samuel, saying, find yourself a Jonathan. Find yourself a Jonathan that you can be held accountable to. That you walk together, you hold each other accountable, you share your concerns, your prayer requests to one another. But this morning, the charge is to you, is who is your Nathan? Do you have a Nathan? Nathan's not the same as Jonathan, right? Jonathan and David can share and talk to one another, but who's your Nathan? Who can come into your life and do what Nathan basically does to King David and so-called get away with it? Do you bow up? Do you get angry? Do you blow it off? He doesn't know. Well, for those of you here in Christ Church in Morgantown, Pastor Jared has that role of being your Nathan. Right? He knows you. Yeah, you can learn things from books. You can learn things from online. You can learn things from blogs. But they don't know you. They know generally what a Christian and a sinner is. Right? And that's what feels and applies to us. But the man that sees you day in, or not necessarily day in, day out, but sees you weekly, talks to you several times a week, we go to his house, we do these things, he knows you. So don't be so quick to harden up. So everyone else, we see that in chapter 11, is sent. Sent here, sent there. And now we've said it is God's turn. Yahweh is not just a passive onlooker. We thought, wow. At the end of chapter 12, we think, did David really just get away with all that stuff? Did King David just get away with murder, adultery? So we see that David sends, Bathsheba sends, Joab sends, and now, of course, Yahweh sends because he is taking action. He's not just sending a messenger to relay what God has said, but he is preparing to take action. 
So now we're going to speak of this vigilance of grace. The vigilance of grace shows us that grace pursues and exposes the sinner and his sin. A lot of times we like to hang on to grace, and I'll probably repeat this several times because I'm jumping around in some of my notes here, but we will see that grace pursues us. But a lot of times we like to think of grace as, ah, I'm forgiven. And we can go on about our own lives, and then yet, maybe within that same day, a week, a month, or even within that same year, we do that same kind of sin again. But grace is more than that. Grace is pursuing us. Yahweh will not allow His servant to remain comfortable in sin, but will ruthlessly expose his sin lest he settle down in it. So are you thankful for grace when your sins get exposed? Prayerfully you go and confess these sins before they are brought forth in a a public exposed kind of way. You're quick to repent. Go to your Jonathan and go to your Nathan. Because you may succeed in unfaithfulness for a while, But being a child of God, Yahweh is going to come after you. Yahweh is going to send one of the commentaries. I forget which one uh, they're referencing. You all may have better minds and remembering than I can of the hounds of grace, the hounds of heaven pursuing you to bring you back, to find you, to find where you are. So Yahweh will come after you if you are a child of God. So He will not allow you to continue in succeeding in your unfaithfulness. Not that God's pursuing grace is always enjoyable, right? Let's let's admit it, when you are caught, when the grace does find you in your sin, it can be quite uncomfortable at times. It can be hard to move forward. So what if grace did not pursue? What if, in this story, David did get away with this? And what if you are continually being successful in your unfaithfulness and God didn't pursue you? What if Yahweh abandoned us when we succeed? in our sins. Thankfully, God does not do that to us and He did not do it to King David. So now we're going to talk about the Sabe of grace, if grace, right? I think so. David is the supreme judge here of, of Israel, of Judah, right? of Jerusalem. He is the king. David is the supreme judge and this story stirs his judicial juices. A lot of times we hear stories of people and we like, man, it fires us up. But we forget that maybe a month, two months, or a year ago, we were guilty of the same thing. We like to whitewash ours. I'm getting ahead again. But we like to think of ourselves as innocent. We like have pet names for our sin. But someone else does the exact same sin. All of a sudden, we, we develop biblical terminology for that sin. But when it's our sin, we use the, the pet name we have for it. All right? And I'm guilty of that. This, I was beat up tremendously through the preparation of this, uh, this sermon. So it stirs up his judicial juices again. It's not just a simple theft. We like to downplay, again, of calling it something different, of borrowing or, or whatever it may be. So maybe he thought, David, that this is an actual case. It doesn't matter. Some translations make it quite plain that it is Uh, a parable and some don't but either way David was sucked into the story because Nathan doesn't come in and say hey I got this parable or I got this story Nathan presents it just starts and David listens and David reacts and Nathan didn't tell him that it was just the story so the story we have two men we have one rich we have one poor we hear the description we hear the deed so what the prospective men had, what it tells us what they had, it only uses one line to talk about the rich man. Right? So he was rich worldly wise, but the poor man, poor worldly wise with possessions, was he not more blessed? Because it takes four times as much space as used to describe the poor man. Now obviously it sounds like he goes way over top in describing the ewe lamb, but I think the, the image is there quite honestly, right? The poor man is Uriah, and Bathsheba was the ewe, right? So he goes over the top so that the connection cannot really be missed to those that are reading it. The rich man has far more flocks, but the poor man has far more than the flocks. The poor man has a family circle. doesn't mention anything about a family circle for the rich man. The poor man has the warmth of a home life. Then we find out that the rich man has a guest. How can he feed this guest? 
and being self-centered or being so enveloped of what he must have here on the earth, he loathes the thought of liquidating or using just one of his own sheep. So what's he do? He goes and he steals the one lamb that the poor man had, just as David the king stole Bathsheba. So at this point, David explodes. Because David is seriously religious. Right? A man after God's own heart. He doesn't forget these things. But he's conveniently forgot his sins. So we don't know how long it's been, right? Whew. Got away with that one. So what does David do? He utters the oath. By the life of Yahweh. How quickly he gets sucked into these things. And we do too, right? This is, this is meant to be applied to us as well as we read through. But for this period of time, it is King David. And he's gravely judicial. He calls the rich man a son of death. And he deserves to die. Restitution. Exodus 22 verse 1. I believe it says you need to uh, restore four sheep to one. You stole one sheep. This man's going to give four sheep back. And quite possibly, David says, he could quite possibly be uh, executed. But it's more than property offense here. There's an attitude beneath the act. The attitude of the rich man. The attitude of King David. The attitude of wanting to take things. The attitude of thinking they are deserved. It's heartless. And it's cruel. The rich man is heartless. David was heartless. The rich man is cruel. And David was cruel. So now Nathan may be inside thinking, all right, I got David right where I want him. All right? How many times have you here have heard sermons and have wished you had worn your steel toe shoes for the day, right? Because they have us, the Word of God has us where He wants us. So Nathan's story is obviously a hinge chapter here of chapter 11 and 12 that kind of go together. And I may not even make it all through chapter 12 today. But Nathan's story is the hinge. Nathan's story is the method of grace. For what does Nathan say? You are that man. Now many of us may prefer the John the Baptist approach, as in what he does to right? King Herod. Nathan knew that stout, de stout defenses right, in the mouth can muster against a frontal assault. So if he would have went in right away with the frontal assault, Instead of sitting down and calling David a filthy womanizer, a cruel murderer, he began with, Sir, respect, I want to tell you about a situation. I want to tell you about a story. Right? So it does away with all of King David's defense. So he suckers the king in right into that case. And then David judges, basically, David judges himself. Nathan's techniques is the godly scheming of grace that goes around the end of our resistance and causes us to switch the floodlights on our own darkness. Again, we need to be spending time. Don't just go, and I don't want to mention it later, just don't go through the motions. We say these prayers. We say a different prayer every month during our confession, but that can become so-called routine and not let it apply to our hearts. Listen to those words as you're praying. Read those words. So right now, some of you may need to repent. There's nothing unethical about this grace that tracks us down and finds it for the godly scheming of grace, the holy craftiness of grace. If God determines to bring you back to repentance, what chance do you have against grace like this? Somewhere in here, I forget. But, but don't play dodgeball with grace. Don't try to outrun grace. Don't try to hide from grace. Oh my goodness, if I go over here, my sin won't be found out. If I go over here, I won't have to confess. For I've confessed it privately. No one needs to know about it. All right, so as we... Amazing Grace was, a, was a definitely a good song to be singing today. And again, God did all that. I didn't, I didn't call Evan and say, hey, let's sing Amazing Grace this week. But... Grace is far more than amazing, right? Because it's smart. And it also is what grace taught our hearts to fear. We should be fearful of God. We should fear God. We like to think of grace as all calm again in this nice little peaceful area where there is no fear. So we talk about the three things of Nathan's judgment speech. Grace, he talks about grace in verse 7 and 8, and the accusation comes in verse 9. 
And then we see in the retribution of verses 10 through 12. For sin to appear as it did, it should and must stand in the blaze of grace. For us to fully see and understand, we may never fully see and understand what sin is and how ugly and gross it can be and how it draws us down. We may know, fully know until we were with heaven and know what Jesus had to do, the Son of God, the perfect Lamb, had to do for our sins. We need to take and stand in the blaze of grace, let our sin, sins be exposed and confess them. Treachery may only appear hideous when viewed against the fidelity. All right. So, what does part of the story? What 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 is God's what is God saying through Nathan to David? He said, "I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house. I gave you your master's wives into your possession." That doesn't necessarily mean a sexual thing there. Back then when they did that sort of thing, you took care of the wives of the man that you defeated. You cared for them. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. You lacked absolutely nothing but one thing, and quite frankly, that was the contentment. He was not content. Not content where he was. Not content with the things that he had. And he said, I would have given you all the more. You didn't ask. Again, a lack of contentment. He saw it and he took it. The senselessness of David's sin now. The senselessness of David's sin. Obviously we see here that David was hardly deprived. David really was the rich man. He had no need to take both the poor man's wife and his life. So God knows why, but God is basically saying here, why did you feel the need to do these things? Why did you go forward and do these David not only committed iniquity, but he destroyed persons. He destroyed lives. He destroyed a family. He sinned against the Yahweh and ruined the people and ruined people. For the sword against Yahweh, for the sword against Uriah, the sword will not turn away from your house forever. Now, so now he's going through and telling David what's going to be happening. Because David took Uriah's wife, Yahweh will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your companion. What you did in secret, David, your companion will do so in public. There will always be trouble in David's house, and it's a primary theme as we continue to go through 2 Samuel verse, or verses, chapters 13 through 20. So now it is unleashed. So this needs to ask us as men in our households, and even single men, you're planting seeds now within your houses, getting ready for a family one day. But what are the things you are planting in your house? We need to repent now and not continue to plant certain seeds within our house as they will go through the rest of our lives. So we have a fury of grace. We have the fury of grace. We despise and we treat with contempt. We saw that in the, in the Word today that when you purposefully sin, purposefully plan, plot to get away and do certain sins, you are despising God. You are despising the Word of God. You have despised the word of Yahweh by doing evil. David treated them as though they did not matter. I'm the king. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do what I want. Men in your homes, this is my home. I'm going to do what I want. Does it line up with the word of God? With what you want to say? With what you want to do? To despise Yahweh's word, however, is to despise the one who has given us the word. We trample on His commandment and we trample on the commander. So therefore, we see in verse 10, it is crying, you have despised me. A lot of times in our sins, we want to hurry up, get confessed, get the grace and move on. But we don't fully understand what we just did. We despised the commander. We despised his word. So Yahweh sees the true significance of sin, both in David and in us. We need to grasp that. We need to understand that. We need to intellectually understand the fury of grace. Taught our hearts to fear. So when the gracious God sends a Nathan to us, we need to understand at that point in time, God is very furious. Because quite frankly, we despised Him. Yes, His love. He showed His love for us. He gave us His Son to die on the cross. We can go and ask for forgiveness, but when we continually hide, we continually try to not confess this sin, 
we like to think of he's up there, you know, we talk, you know wringing his hands and, and fear or, or, or worry over us. No, right? He's hurt. He's furious. Fear God. So sometimes we try to so-called declaw grace. I don't want to berate this point continually over and over. What? I say grace as I look over at my daughter. Sarah Grace. <laughs> grace. Brings a whole other meaning to the name, right? We should also understand that grace is coming after us to a point of wanting us to expose our sins so that we may confess them. Grace is not always the niceness. Grace is not merely favor. It is also the fury that precedes the favor. The favor comes, but the hounds, the fury of God, bringing you to repentance. So now we see the miracle of grace. We see that David, and we know that David, if you Leviticus 20 and Deuteronomy 22, David deserved death. Grace shows us what David received. Forgiveness and the commuting of the death sentence. He no longer has the death sentence. So don't think that David is getting off easy unless you want to condemn yourself. David's confession, simple, to the point, I have sinned against Yahweh. I have sinned against God, the Creator of the universe. I have sinned against Yahweh. So some of us may think and be, wait, what? Really? He does all that and that's all he has to do or say? Is he expected to say some kind of right formula? Would we prefer him to wallow in his guilt and plead, beg, and agonize over the possibility of a pardon? Do we assume that intensity of repentance contributes to the atonement? Right? We've all been in certain kind of uh, places where some people are wailing and beating their chests and crying and others are confessing as well and there's not a tear in the eye. There's no formula. I'm not saying that someone shouldn't be broken at some point over their sin, but there is no formula. David got it right. He sinned against Yahweh. Do we assume, oh, you said that. So simplicity marks David's confession. I have sinned against Yahweh. Simplicity makes it commendable rather than defective. Right? And, and then the, the publican may come to mind. Luke, Luke chapter 18, we won't uh, discuss some of that, but the simplicity of it. He is a thoroughly broken spirit. So when you confess, confess to someone or confess to God, do you have a broken spirit? You should have no excuses. You should have no cloaking, no covering it. And do you do it only to relieve the pain? I just want to be over this pain. Or do you mean the confession? Don't be searching for a loophole. Don't blame the human weakness. You're a sinner. You have flesh. Don't blame that. You confess. It was you. You've done it. You've angered God. You treated Him with despising Him. Despise, right? Hatred. We need to acknowledge our guilt openly, candidly, and not skirting around the truth. So here we want to go into comparing David and Saul briefly. The state of a man's heart is revealed in his response to the criticism of the Word of God. When you read or when something's preached from the Word of God and it touches you, does it anger you? How, do, do you get excited about it? Do you get excited that, oh my goodness, I do that? That's to me today. So are you sensitive to the divine critique? Was David sensitive to this divine critique? Again, some of us have been joking or watching the little video of a, a pastor getting frustrated. Right? He puts his head down. and If you haven't seen it, it's what the frustrated uh, pastor I may be called, but he yells at the congregation, Stop it! <laughs> Stop sinning! Stop it! He yells. It's easier said than done, and we laugh. It's a funny thing, but there's some truth there. There's some stop it. There just comes a time we need to confess it and we need to stop it. Be the man after God's own heart. Be that man, be that woman after God's own heart. It does not mean to be sinlessly perfect, but it does mean to not hide or scoot your sin somewhere else where no one else can see it. and Keep it there in your pocket as a pet. 
But to be utterly submissive to the accusing word of God. Be utterly submissive to what God is telling us. His accusing word. Now we go into David's assurance. Pretty sure we're not going to get all the way through chapter 12 today. <laughs> I should have looked at the clock when I got up here, but I didn't. So y'all just have to stay put. No. <laughs> so Yahweh himself has put away your sin. You will not die. Right? We will die one day. No one has lived forever. But Jesus himself died for our sins. So Yahweh himself has put away David's sin now and tells him you will not die. So we as the church, we have lost the marvel of such forgiveness. We take it for granted. We take it for granted. We view it sometimes as a vending machine. We put in our humble token, mumble the prayer, pull the lever, out comes grace and forgiveness. We don't let it seize our minds. We don't let it touch our emotions at all. Someone put that, I don't know if it was Lightheart or Davis, but he calls it the goosebumps. We have lost the goosebumps of our souls. I don't think that's a light heart. say that's probably more of a Davis, but I laugh when I read it and put it down because we have. We've become hardened a lot of times. So we see in Micah uh, chapter 7, verse 18, God, who, who, God does, passes over rebellion. It should make us shudder with joy. Knowing what we deserve, knowing what we are receiving should make us shudder, should give us these goosebumps. So now let's talk briefly about David's uh, substitute. Yes, Yahweh forgives the guilt of sin, but inflicts the consequences of sin. There's consequences of sin. It's not the same as being paying for your sin, but there are consequences. A lot of time, my biggest example, many of you have heard me, was Moses. Moses struck the rock. He wasn't to strike the rock. Moses goes through all that in the wilderness, and God doesn't let him go into the promised land. Right? The man of God does not get to go to the promised land because he hit a rock out of anger. Right? That should wake some of us up. There's consequences to our sins. We already know, we're going to see through the rest of uh, 2 Samuel, the consequences of David's sin. So, he cleanses sins. God cleanses sins, defilement, but may continue its discipline. For David, Yahweh's forgiveness was marvelous, but yet also costly. What is it this time? And it was that he tells him that your child through Bathsheba, your child through adultery, your child through fornication, this child is going to die. So something, when, when you sin, sin causes death. And Nick in a relationship could be in many different areas. So David was the one under the threat of death. But in this situation... The son, is, the son dies or the child dies. So David was assured he would not die. But we know there will be a continual death theme within uh, 2 Samuel because all in all, King David ends up losing four sons. Four sons die from King David. So the child to be born would die. The child is David's substitute. And now we can see that the forgiveness is that it is both free and costly. What was our cost? The death of Jesus Christ. The pain and suffering of the cross. That's a cost. Someone paid it for us. And again, this is pointing towards that. Alright. The sense of grace. We see David's behavior. After he confesses, he's prayer, he's praying, he's fasting. But the child dies. He knows God. He knows grace. Maybe God will have grace. Right? It's another form, another part of grace that maybe God will relent and not allow the child to die. Then the servants are afraid to tell him, but he asks the direct question. He gets a direct answer. When you ask a direct question, are you prepared for the direct answer? The direct answer is from the Word of God. Sometimes we don't like them. Sometimes we don't want them. David accepts it. So then what does he do? He gets up, cleans himself, he goes, and he eats. So, who can imagine how gracious the God of all grace wants to be to us in our sins and in our messes, in the middle of our sins, in the middle of our messes, especially when we haven't confessed them yet. We're in the swamp. We're in the swamp of despair, right? It's all around us. I think of swamp, the mosquitoes. 
nasty things that are in there. But we don't think of God. We don't think of grace. We don't think of, of getting the forgiveness. But David understands grace. And this is what we're talking about today. Do we understand grace? Do we understand that there is hope for a fallen believer? Do we understand there is hope when we have sinned and caved continually to our sins? Are we conscious of our failures? Do we have failures in our lives? Failures? Do we have sins in our lives that we're not conscious of? Right? Are we willing to accept the Nathan to come and make us conscious of our failures and of our sins? Are we repentant of our sins? A lot of times we think that we have grounds for no mercy, that God will not show us mercy. But God is a God of love, a God of mercy. He shows David mercy, even though there's consequences. We know that there's mercy on David here. And there is mercy in your life as well. You may think you are doomed to exist within the confines of God's frown the rest of your days. Well, what does he tell David? You will never lack a descendant sitting on your throne. And we know Jesus, the son of David. So this passage, what we're talking about, does not mean to help you excuse the guilt of your sin, but to help you get beyond the despair of your sin. Real quickly, reading through the Bible this year, and always I've talked to uh, Kofi about it before, and maybe Jared, I'm not sure, Pastor Jared. And in First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, it's full of examples of what? And he did right according to his father David. Well, read chapter 11 makes you scratch your head a little bit, right? But he did right and God blessed the kingdom then. So there are um, grace and mercy that we interpret it as well. Grace and mercy. Mercy of God coming and, and blessing the kingdoms. And then there's also the what? And he did unrighteous according to his father David. And then Jerusalem and Israel and Judah, they're all punished when that happens. Alright, we're going to stop there. I'm going to jump to applications just real quick. When God catches up to you, what do you do with it? When grace catches up to you, what do you do with it? Do you just blow it off? Do you repent? Do you play dodgeball? Do you dodge it? Do you hide from it? Do you recognize it that it is amazing grace? Do you recognize it that it is the fearful grace that we need to repent? Number two, so when we convict ourselves unknowingly as David did, and Nathan has to tell him, you are that man, are you grateful when you judge someone else of they should not have done such things and then someone says, you do such things? How do you receive it? Do you argue, justify yours, or call yours by a different pet name? Can you think of a time when God's grace caught up with you? So we also see that the fury of grace is before favor. And is that a new concept to you? Is it a new concept that a lot of times there's a fury of grace before we get the favor of grace? Not that we are paying for it, but there are consequences. And so let, let us be quick to repent and accept the grace that God has given us. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we do thank you for this time together as your church body. We thank you again for your word. We thank you for this example of David, King David. To us. Let grace expose our sins. Let us be quick to repent. Let us be quick to find a Nathan. Let us be quick to accept and not defend or become angry or bow up or become hardened, especially to your word. Again, we thank, again, once, we, once again, we thank you for your written word. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.